Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the next CPI talk, uh, the next talk in the CPI talk series. Um, my name is Ashokan. I'm the executive director of uh, Waterloo Cybersecurity and Privacy Institute, who is hosting CPI talks. Um, next slide, please. So as usual, let me begin with uh, territorial acknowledgement. Um, those of us who work at the University of Waterloo and live in the, in the neighborhood of uh, Waterloo or Kitchener, uh, live and work in the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabeg and other Haudenosaunee people. Uh, uh, our main campus is situated on uh, the Haldiman Tract, which is the land granted to the Six Nations that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. Um, some of you are in uh, are participating from different places, and I invite uh, all of you to take a moment to recognize the, the uh, territory that uh, we live and work in and acknowledge the, the people uh, uh, who are the traditional uh, occupants of this territory. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm uh, uh, very happy to uh, be the host of the uh, second talk in the CPI talk series. CPI talks is a public outreach uh, lecture series. It is a new initiative by CPI. Uh, we launched that in uh, two months ago during our October Cybersecurity Month uh, sequence of events. Uh, today, CPI talk is the second in the series, and we hope to have about four to six talks every year, roughly once every two or three months. Um, as a public outreach initiative, the intended audience is the general public, so no prior knowledge or expertise in cybersecurity or privacy is assumed. Um, the idea is uh, for us to invite uh, world-leading experts like today's speaker uh, from, uh, um, uh, from around the world as well as from CPI at the University of Waterloo uh, and ask them to explain important uh, cybersecurity and privacy issues to the public at large. In particular, we welcome uh, high school students and, uh, and uh, early year undergrads uh, so that they can get a flavor of what cybersecurity and privacy uh, are like. Uh, like I said, our speakers are well-known experts and role models. Uh, our hope is that some of you in the audience will be inspired uh, both by the topics and by the speakers uh, to, to consider specializing in uh, cybersecurity and privacy yourselves. Uh, so with that, let me introduce uh, today's speaker, Dr. Daphne Yao. Um, she's a professor of computer science uh, at Virginia Tech. Um, she's an Elizabeth and James E. Turner Jr. 56 uh, faculty fellow and a CACI faculty fellow. Um, she's a well-known expert in cybersecurity who has made uh, significant research contributions that have uh, influenced uh, major players in the, in the information technology industry. Um, she has received a number of awards. I'm not going to list all of them, uh, but one example is that this year she received a, a lasting research award. This is an award at a major cybersecurity conference that's given to work that has stood the test of time. Um, she has also been active at uh, mentoring uh, younger researchers. And I want to point out notably that she started her career uh, um, studying chemistry and uh, uh, during her grad studies, she pivoted to computer science and cybersecurity. And, uh, and for those of you who are not from uh, computer science, uh, uh, that should sort of uh, um, serve as an inspiration that uh, there are many paths to excellence in, in cybersecurity. With that, uh, let me invite uh, Daphne to take the stage. All right, thank you so much Ashokan for the kind introduction. Um, I'm really grateful to have this opportunity to present, and, and Shokan is also my collaborator. Um, I'm very lucky to have an uh, opportunity to interact with him and now with uh, the, the institute uh, that he directs. Um, and data breach is something that I'm very passionate about, but I want to say a little bit about myself. Uh, this is with my husband uh, and my my daughter. Uh, we visited uh, Sichuan province, uh, Lushan Buddha before COVID. Great trip. Um, as Ashoka mentioned that I studied chemistry, I was in the PhD program uh, in Princeton. Um, 
but then that was the late 90s. It was dot com boom. And so everyone was taking CS classes. So, so did I. And it was just so fascinating. And, and, and in the meantime, I was a horrible experimentalist uh, I, that I discovered. And so, so I, it took me a long time to decide should I quit? Should, should, should I or, or not quit? And so I actually quit in the middle of my PhD study. Um, and then uh, I went to Indiana University, I got a master's degree in, in computer science. Um, by the time I graduated from Indiana, the dot com boom, bur the bubble bursted, and so um, and and I and I I wanted to become a programmer, but then at that time I. I I thought that maybe I can do more in this field. I can go deeper, and so I uh, went to Brown for a PhD. And uh, right now, I've already been um, working with. Uh, working at Virginia Tech for 12 plus years and it's just a fascinating journey and so so really it, I you don't have to be um, taking parts of radios you know taking parts of computers from five years old in order to make contribution to, to CS uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as well um, I went back to Brown gave a talk on data breach um, prevention and I was looking at my pictures do I have my working picture and it turns out I I I have none. I, I took pictures about me walking on the beach, kayaking, skiing downhill, and so so it was it was a fun time at, at Brown. Um, and I I learned a lot. I did uh, applied crypto in you know, a more theoretical work, and well, as an independent PI, uh, the investigator, I my work is most on more applied research and you know, system and software security. Um, and so I will talk about data breach, but I was also done a lot of work on um, scanning software for vulnerabilities. Uh, one of my, my solution, CryptoGuard, is being used by Oracle Labs um, to scan their Java uh, projects and their big code bases. Um, and I want to say that this computing field, uh, in particular cybersecurity, is very diverse. Um, I organized multiple workshops, and this is uh, uh, in 2017, um, uh, one of my women in computing, women in cybersecurity workshop. Um, great time, and, and I'm uh, organizing, I mentor workshop um, and the, the message that we really want to convey is that there are just many different ways to do cybersecurity. Um, it's not just about hacking. Um, and you, you know, there's you, if you think cybersecurity, you think of oh, hackers, or hoodies, and, and so on. Uh, no, there's there's you know, you can look like a normal person. And same thing with computing. You know, computing has so much to offer beyond coding, um, as as you will all see. Uh, in this year's I mentor workshop that I organized, I read a Perlman, uh, a National Academy of Engineering. Member uh, who made seminal contributions to the internet routing, you know, the what uh, packets are being routed are really based on her algorithms. Um, and she she gave a fantastic talk. I, I hope you can all check it out on our website. You can just Google I Mentor 2021, you'll be able to find it. Um, so so about data breach. Um, in just a little bit of history, you know, a lot of people don't understand that things keep changing, keep evolving back in the 80s, the early 90s. It was all curiosity-driven hacking, um, you know, teenagers uh, defaced certain websites. As a matter of fact, uh, when Ken Thompson accepted the National Medal of Technology and Innovation at, in White House, he said, oh, you know, these uh, hackers didn't, would not amount to anything. Now, you know, 20 years for 40, 30 years later, obviously that couldn't be more wrong, right? So you see nation backed hackings, um, cybersecurity is being weaponized, um, ransomware, uh, CPS uh, attacks. Um, and, and recently we see a lot of zero day supply chain attacks where software being hacked and then all the clients that use software are being hacked. And so, so very different from back in the eighties when Barbara Fraser from Cisco, she said that back in the eighties, Several security problems a day at the beach. But nowadays, when you're at the beach, the hackers are working. And so we will uh, uh, attack. This is a Kesaya um, supply chain attack happened during the Independence Day this year. Uh, uh, long break, long weekend this year. And so uh, in September, before Labor Day, 
the um, the U.S. government, the DHS, issued a warning saying that you know holidays and weekends you really have to be careful for for ransomware. Same thing before the Thanksgiving holidays, FBI gave warnings and making sure that the system are being uh, monitored. Um, and five years ago, actually on Black Friday, Thanksgiving break, um, San Francisco subway station was hacked, and and no, you know you cannot buy tickets. Um, in, and so in the end, the, the municipal transport agency decided that everyone rides subway for free because they have to go shopping on Black Fridays. Um, 100 Bitcoin, every time I try to find out how much Bitcoin was, it just skyrocketed. Um, five years ago, the, the ransom demand uh, was worth a million dollars. Nowadays, 100 Bitcoin worth $5 million, more than $5 million. Um, and this is a timeline, you know, my share of the data breaches. Um, and of course, the 2013 one with the Target data breach. Um, and I received a letter um, in from Target. Um, that was really the moment that I start to think, wait a minute, I can do all the you know careful things that I I have the strongest password I I put up you know I I patch I update my software, but then my credit card information my personal information being stored by those uh, providers, then I cannot control. And so that's really the moment that I started to think, um, want to look into a bit closer into this data breach situation. And there's also good news. Um, more, as more and more people are aware and more and more leaders are aware of uh, the, da the danger of uh, data breaches and then they are more prepared and so some of the local uh, small cities and towns they back up their data so they don't have to pay ransom and interestingly half of the people who pay the ransom um, still cannot get their data back. Um, I mean, you're dealing with hackers and so they, they don't have a lot of integrity um, so it's not unexpected. Um, and the good news is that uh, you know more than half the people didn't have to pay. They they have backup, um, and they can reinstall their system. In the San Francisco subway uh, system, um, it's uh, the machines that are hacked are just dumb terminals, and so they can just uh, reinstall operating system. There's no sensitive sensitive data being locked. Um, there's the additional good news. Um, so just last. You know, in October, um, this Revo um, hacking group who launched the Kesaya ransomware uh, attack um, was shut down. In the the leader, uh, their their servers was hacked by U.S. Cyber Command and the foreign government, and then the leader was spoofed. And, and the person said, "Good luck, everyone. I'm taking off." Um, so, um, and and then it's gonna as you see as you do this uh, cybersecurity research long enough, you see, okay, it's just a cat and mouse game, you know, arms race, it's back and forth, uh, whack-a-mole. Um, and, and so there's a lot of people don't understand, even security researchers, some researchers, they don't understand security is relative. Um, as, as a matter of fact, that, that someone called Fred Cohen proved it back in the 80s that you cannot achieve perfect security. It's, it's impossible. Um, and the, the, the proof is very similar to the proof of halting problem. Um, but then in reality, you see this play out in slow motion every day. If you're a hacker, you develop malware, the first thing you do before you launch the, the malware to the wild is you run some antivirus scan. Um, if your malware malicious software tri tri uh, triggers any alerts, then you tweak it so that it won't trigger any, any additional alerts, but then have the same functionality. Um, and so, so as long as the attackers knows how you def de de defend, how you detect them, and they will be able to circumvent it. And then you just have to do more. Um, and so, um, in, and so, but, but but then this this doesn't mean that the defenders shouldn't try very hard. Um, and so that's really the message I'm going to explain through all these um, examples of real life uh, data breach instances. Um, so target data breach happened during the this, uh, holiday break, so holiday shopping uh, time. Um, and what happened is that at attacker first compromised um, uh, AC uh, provider. It's a heating and air conditioning company called Fazio Mechanical. And for whatever reason, network um, the target didn't do a very good job segmenting the networks of the 
contractors and their internal network. And so the hacker is able to get all the way into the internal target network and then install malicious software on the point of sale devices where you slide your credit card. Um, and so the, the malware um, collect all the credit card information, dumped it into internal server and then eventually exfiltrated it into external site. And, and so that was that was happening in November of 2013. But early in the spring, in March, um, the, some Russian websites, online black market, is already someone selling this black POS malicious software. Um, and this is an English translation. Someone said, oh, you know, I'm looking for something to attack a very phones. You know, this is a this is a the victim system that I have in mind. I, I, I'm looking for malware that works for this system. And then you know for two thousand dollars it wasn't really not that expensive. Um, and then also you can see that the person who developed the malicious software doesn't have to be the person who use it. Um, and, and really you don't have to be a, a good coder to to launch those kind of attacks. There's um, uh, um, a, a chain um, that you can purchase the code. And so, um, so the first question people ask, does the, the air conditionings, air conditioners launching attacks um, on the, the target internal networks? And so, so Fazio um, system has to issue, had to issue a, a statement saying that, no, 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 the, the cooling system and the refrigerators are not smart enough to install malware. And so then you wonder how, how is that, you know, connected to the internal target network. And so, so one theory is that um, the, the middleman, the bridge that connects it to a, some sort of uh, invoice payment system um, uh, by SAP, this is SAP is a, a French-based uh, 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 company, a large uh, IT company. And, and so when you submit the invoices and target download the invoices, the PDF, the, the system, the invoice could be compromised and then target end up downloading malicious code. Um, so this is just a one theory. It turns out that there's not, not a lot of um, Detail the report and in, in, in this in, in this investigation um, back in the 2013. And so really lost the opportunity uh, in terms of lessons that we can learn from this. Um, and and the good thing is that later on when Equifax data breach happened and it's much better. I'll talk about that later. Um, and so if you look closer. Uh, FireEye did, uh, Target did use this uh, intrusion detection system called FireEye. FireEye is a leading intrusion detection system, IDS. It will look at your network traffic, or, you know, generate alerts. Um, and, and two alerts were generated. Um, and the, the alerts were uh, sent by the uh, cybersecurity team of a Target uh, the outsourced uh, in India to the target headquarters in Minnesota. Um, however, it, so it's unclear why the alerts were sent to the headquarters um, you know, without doing anything. Um, and also why the headquarters, the executive uh, chose, chose not to do anything. Um, and they thought, probably thought it's five false alarms. But in, very interestingly, if you know FireEye, you know it has very low false alarms. And false alarms are, you know, nobody likes it. The island of Hawaii, um, Hawaii back in the 2018 experienced 30 minutes of hell, um, I think because there was a missile alert that lasted for almost uh, 40 minutes, um, and turns out it, it was a false alarm. Um, so nobody likes that. It. It's just a waste of time and resources. On average, um, people find that uh, two, two hour and a half, two and a half hours is a time when an expert an expert security analyst to try to confirm whether an alert is real or not. So is it true positive? Is, is it something that you should take action on? Um, and, and so you cannot expect people to be able to process hundreds of alerts a day. Uh, it's, it's just not very feasible. And so, so that's what FireEye realized. And, and, and then the success of it, their intrusion detection tools is to generate as a few fossil positives, false alarms as possible, even at the expenses, as an expense of missing some of the uh, vulnerability, uh, some of the, the intrusions. Um, and so, so this is a trade-off that you just have to, um, um, to decide on. 
when you when you consider those deployment situations. And so uh, interestingly, one of the research opportunity would be generate a better warning system for security analysts, because technical solutions would be useless if people don't know how to use it. Um, and so while I was investigating the target data breach, uh, it, it mentions the, C, the former CEO who later stepped down um, amid all the, you know, um, the, the, the scandal said that Target was actually certified as uh, 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 following the, the payment card industry data security standards. And so I was curious, what is this payment card industry? And it turns out PCI is uh, formed by the big banks. And this is not just US, this is international organization. Um, the PCI conferences, they hold conferences to, to uh, tell people what the data security standards are, how to enforce them. And, and the standards has to be enforced on any system, on all systems that touches payment cards. And so, so you know, if you think of the ecosystem of the payment um, um, in our modern day payment, it, you have uh, the banks that issue credit cards, the debit cards, the banks that process the payments, and then the merchants in the in between, you know, Walmart, uh, McDonald's, and, and those kind of merchants. And, and so uh, big banks realize that they're losing money left and the right because of fraud. And, and so, so they require all these organizations and systems to be, to, to do more work, um, to be compliant to some security standards. And so this is a questionnaire, some of the companies they have to fill out uh, to say they're compliant or not. This is like self-attestation. But on top of that, they also have to have automatic scanning, which happens every quarter. Um, and so you, every quarter, um, and all vendors, the big or small, has to go through this scanning, external scanning, um, um, process requirement and, and then submit a report saying that you know, the system does not have a lot of vulnerabilities, um, is compatible with the data security standards. And so, so big or small on the top, it shows the transaction per year, the number of transaction per year. You see, if you have a small business, you still have to fulfill this quarterly scan. And, and approve the scanning vendors are companies who offer these scanning services. And so I'm curious, I, I wonder, I know this is not an easy problem for my, I'm a security researcher. I know scanning externally uh, of a system, a server to see whether they have cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery, is not easy. And so, so how good are the scanners? And this is just this one of the scanners, I'm anonymizing the, the name, um, you know, because of, there's a legal, uh, some, some companies uh, will say, uh, we're gonna sue you if you publish our scanning results without our approval. And, and you see that there's no security. This is just a regular port scan, very basic scanning. So how good are they? If they are not good, then the websites, uh, the vulnerable websites will still be certified. Um, and so we set up a, a test bed and uh, we, um, ask the scanners to, to scan us and see if they can identify some of the vulnerabilities. And sure enough, uh, um, five out of the six scanners that we tested uh, would certify our site while there are still vulnerabilities. And, and if you look at the, the standards, the payment card industry uh, standards, specified standards, those vulnerabilities should be eliminated before anyone can, any websites can be certified. And so we also uh, put up our own simple scanner uh, and scan a few, uh, a thousand, more than a thousand e-commerce websites that take credit cards information and a majority of them are not compliant, not PCI compliant. And so the PCI standards are extremely good, very comprehensive, but then the actual enforcement is very tough. Um, while disclosing this, this finding to the PCI industry, I talked to uh, an expert in, in their office and he shared a little bit of insight. In, it's almost that they anticipate this to be happening. Um, they, they said that a lot of time that um, the scanners are all pretty bad. 
And then they have, they set up test beds and then they, they, um, uh, they uh, I think twice a year, they ask the scanners to get certified. Um, that, you know, you have to prove the scanners first before they can uh, scan other people. But then all scanners are pretty bad, and so they have to almost to lower their standards and to make it uh, easier for the scanners. And otherwise, no one will be able to scan. And, and so, so this really uh, point out the need for researchers to to help them to help those communities. And a lot of time, that the researcher will think, ah, cross that request for forgery, cross that scripting done, solved. Been there, done that. I don't want to do this anymore. It's no longer interesting to me. But then, in reality, it's, it's still um, people need help. Um, and so, so I'll talk. Um, you know, towards the end, I'll, I'll talk about different stakeholders uh, can can do to to help improve the situation because it's it's just a big ecosystem. One of the good news is that Target really learned a lot of good lessons after the data breach, including uh, you use uh, two-factor authentication for remote access. As a matter of fact, the PCI data standards also get updated. Um, the multi-factor authentication um, was uh, became a, a requirement. Um, I think starting from January 2018. And before that, it was just a recommendation and later on became a requirement. And so it's, it's a standard that keeps evolving. Target also doing some data sharing, uh, intelligence sharing websites, the initiatives, so which allow them to just to get early information. For example, Euro European countries oftentimes got hacked early um, because they're just uh, open for business early this, you know, six, seven hours ahead of the US and North America. And so, so sharing information really helped a lot. Um, and so I want to I want to say a little bit uh, about Acrifax. Uh, and Acrifax is just a fascinating case. Um, and, and I would say more depressing than Target. Um, first of all, one of the, the, the root cause of Acrifax data breach and that happened in 2017 was because of vulnerability that unpatched. And it was, um, the vulnerability was announced in March in 2017. Um, together with a patch, a patch is, um, the vulnerability is a bug in software. A patch is a way to fix the bug. Um, and the yearly that it's, both of them are announced at the same time so that uh, hackers would not be able to take advantage of the vulnerability. Um, as you see, the next day, an exploit is, was generated. Exploit is an automatic way of taking advantage of the bug. And so you don't want that. You want to patch it before someone launch this exploit on your system. And, and so you want to patch as soon as possible, hopefully you know, within a month, but it took five months for Equifax to patch. And, and then after this uh, uh, data breach was discovered, Equifax was saying, oh, it was just this one long developer you know, who wasn't careful and, and, and forgot to patch. Um, and this vulnerability, it, it, there's always software vulnerabilities. And, and this is you know, very innocent mistake. Um, it's um, equivalent to executing some external commands. Um, it was showing an error message saying, oh, you give me you know, this server saying, oh, you want me to execute this, this, but, but then this is the wrong format and I'm showing this so that you know, uh, and so you can fix it. And so it was the innocent a gesture, but then turns out to, you know you should never do that because you end up executing external input. External input could come from hackers, and in this case, it's indeed come from hackers. And so, so this kind of uh, vulnerability is, is relatively common, and it can be easily patched. Um, and in cybersecurity, a little patching goes a long way. Um, it's it's easy, it's simple. In some systems that you have to be careful because the um, it, it may disrupt your normal operation if the patch is incompatible with the rest of the the software uh, ecosystem. Um, but but on Linux, you know where those kind of servers uh, are running, you should patch. And so you wonder why didn't a, a Equifax patch? 
Um, and it turns out there's just multiple issues. The stars are, are aligned perfectly for this to happen. Uh, first of all, Acrifax really didn't know what machines have that Apache vulnerable software because they don't have an asset uh, inventory system. And, and so, you know, it, it, it's complete uh, blank in, in terms of, uh, you know, they, they were aware, they were very fully aware of this vulnerability. They just don't know where to direct the effort. And also, so they, they uh, later the investigation by the US Senate find out that Acrofax had this honor system for patching where you, you know there's no uh, confirmation whether you have patched within certain days and there's no requirement internally. They're like, okay, I trust you. I trust you will patch in a timely fashion. And turns out to this in this uh, case, the developer didn't receive the vulnerability notice, um, even though the notice was um, sent over uh, by the team to by the the internal uh, cybersecurity team in you know, Acrifax, um, so it's just a get lost. Um, so so you may wonder, okay, it's just a one off thing. Really, shouldn't blame. I mean, you said the security is relative, but 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 then later on, people find out that Acrifax website has cross site request uh, uh, cross site scripting. It's very common, um, very common, and and. In, in, and then it's it's a completely preventable uh, issue, and you just sanitize the form. You make sure form doesn't have script code, okay? And then people also find that when you freeze your your account, your credit account, um, they use a timestamp as a pin, which can be guessed, uh, not a good idea. In the South America Equifax office, people use admin admin as username and password for employee database. A horrible idea. I mean, this is so rudimentary. You don't have to, to have, have to be a cybersecurity expert in order to understand this is not a good idea, right? So security is relative, but really it doesn't mean that you shouldn't make any effort. Um, and the organization culture, culture is just so important. All these uh, signs, all these facts that uh, we discussed collectively reflect and then point to the fact that Equifax hasn't really, hadn't at least um, up to uh, 2017, put any thoughts in cybersecurity, right? And I mean, it's, all the mistakes were just uh, um, so basic. And, and that indeed um, was what the US Senate uh, subcommittee on investigations find out. Um, the subcommittee um, put together a 71 pages report that said, the title is How Equifax Neglected Cybersecurity and Suffered a Devastating Data Breach. And that's indeed the case. And the report is just fascinating. And this is, uh, I'm just very glad that the, the, the government is putting together this effort to do the investigation and, and it held the company accountable. Um, and um, and so, so lots of details, so for example, um, the, you know, Equifax response after in you know, response to this uh, vulnerability um, was completely inadequate, not patching, um, and and the, it, it took a long time for them to patch, um, and and then but then it's a shortcoming. This lack of cybersecurity awareness, uh, um, complete uh, weak management is is a longstanding problem. In 2015, two years before the breach. More than 8,000 unpatched, uh, unpatched bugs were found in Acrifax. And, and, and this is a perfect place for, for someone to use a scream emoji uh, three times, right? So um, it, it just is so scary. And then they didn't learn anything. You know, no one followed up on this uh, um, uh, 2015 audit. Uh, it's just a culture of a complete, complete, uh, complacency towards um, Cybersecurity preparedness, um, you know, it's just uh, we'll go with the flow, and that's really not not the right way to go. And because they are sitting on a lot of American information, a lot of American citizens and permanent, you know, residency information. Uh, whenever you apply for a mortgage, buying a house, buying a car, or student loan, you get your um, credit uh, checked, and and so they have all the sensitive information. Um, if you know you sit on this trove of sensitive information, you should do a, a better job. And in reality, there are so many ways to protect cyber systems. Um, and so as the Senate 
report pointed out many of the issues are completely preventable in Equifax. You can patch, you, you put together inventory system, you install intrusion detection systems and they scan the network borders, network segmentations. Um, you use privacy preserving solutions to minimize data loss, uh, store data if you are not used in an encrypted in, in, in a way. And so, um, you know, better access control, multi-factor authentication, just so many ways. Um, uh, for a company to protect their data. Um, in, in also, like our last time the speaker uh, mentioned, uh, Jen and uh, Ian, don't collect data that you don't need. Um, and uh, in, and so, so there's just so many things that organizations really should be more ca uh, caring uh, for the consumer's uh, information. Um, and you know, on a superficial level, lots of the people would, would you know, the way that the news media portrays cyber hacks as, as if it's just, just completely, you're, you're just a rate, you know, surrender, okay? Um, but then but then it's not the case. You know, after you look at those uh, specific incidents in, in a closer look, you, you know, there's just so many things people can do. Um, and there's also a concept called the defense in depth. So where you have multiple layers of defenses, almost redundancy in case one fail, the other one kicks kick in. Um, so, um, and, and by the way, one of the, um, the, the data leak, uh, one, the one kind of data leak is called accidental data leak, uh, which is also very common. Um, it could, could be caused by uh, negligent uh, um, users, um, uh, you, you know, where the people email attach confidential files to themselves and then later downloaded the files to unauthorized computers so they can work on them while on vacation. Uh, and, and so, so a lot of times that you really shouldn't do that, the you know, data has to be encrypted and, and cannot go through certain borders. And so we have done some work that also look at uh, data leak, this accidental data leak where you have uh, unencrypted, inf in, unencrypted information, exposed to sensitive information going through network borders and so on. Um, and, and so just so very quickly, we have a way called the fuzzy um, uh, fingerprinting, and so that allow a third party, uh, uh, you know, like a cloud, will be able to do this detection. And then, but but then, you know, while there is uh, detection happening, the the cloud would not be able to learn your sensitive information because the comparison is is a fuzzy. It, um, they they will they will be able to find the leak, but not able to learn the actual uh, sensitive information. Um, we also have a follow up work that to look at if you have data that's semi-transformed and not, not fully encrypted, semi-transformed that, you know, source code gets leaked, can we detect those? Um, and so, so we have some alignment, really smart alignment algorithm um, that does that. And so, so there's, again, many different ways uh, for uh, organizations to protect their data and just to be uh, responsible because the data is not your data, it's really consumer's data um, and you're just caring for them. Uh, you're just temporarily holding them. Um, and so, so um, be more responsible. And so lots of time that um, the talks we, you know, we, we tell people what to do. We tell, you know, consumer, individual what to do. We, we tell researchers what to do. But I also want to discuss what should the executives do? The, the you know, the, the chief uh, security officer, the chief uh, technology officer, um, the chief uh, uh, executive officer. So, you know, what should they do? And so I want to... I want to share with you, uh, this is before the, 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 the newest uh, whistleblower scandal of uh, Facebook face. They were, this, is, this was a, a congressional hearing uh, of Mark Zuckerberg back in the Cambridge Analytica uh, scandal. And, and I was shocked when, when a lawmaker said to Mark Zuckerberg, he said that, oh, Mark, you have two choices. You can go back to California, you can hire the most expensive lawyers and lobbyists and, and then descend them to Capitol Hill. And, and you know, those lobbyists will convince the lawmakers to have the loosest possible regulations on private companies in, in terms of data privacy protection. 
but but you can also you can or you can go back home and then do the right thing and, and start protecting consumers data that you you know had you know sit on a massive um, amount and so I, I was really disappointed i was you know disheartened by this um, comment because you're lawmakers you're you're telling people you're telling a, a private sector person to make this a huge decision just by himself okay um if this this doesn't sound right um and so so but but then it's really highlighted in us um the the lack of power of the some of the the lawmakers, you know, Senate the government, the government, the, the government agencies in, in terms of, you know, the, the lack of influences on the private sectors and the private sectors oftentimes is um, um, had the loose regulation you, you see, you see in the big com tech companies get sued is often lawsuits come from Europe in terms of uh, privacy violations and, and so on. Um, and so a lot of time that I do this talk, um, you know, in the, in the audience, and, you know, for example, uh, Brown has this uh, executive cybersecurity uh, master program, it's sort of an MBA for, for chief security officers. Um, um, you know, I tell them, you know, you, you do need to invest in cybersecurity because otherwise you get you do get fined or, you know, your stock prices um, um, go went down um, in, in, and then, you know, it, it also hurts your reputation and Equifax, interestingly, um, if you see the stock price of Equifax after the breach, it went up. But then at the same time, other companies went up a lot more than Equifax. And so, so, um, it, 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 they, they, um, they do suffer. Uh, companies do suffer from those kind of uh, scandals, um, and let alone you know all the 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 prices they have, the fines and, and the retributions they have to pay. Um, it, when in the in the Senate 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 report on Equifax data breach, uh, it mentions that the most senior managers who oversaw Equifax cybersecurity back then didn't attend their global threats and vulnerability management meetings. And so they, like they're, they, you, you, you really have to be more hands-on if you're a chief security officer. Um, you need to understand the damage, the potential damage, the impacts, um, and you know, go to executive cybersecurity programs if you have to learn, right? So, so um, the, the, you know, great power comes with great responsibilities. And that's really what, what I've uh, been telling the, the leaders uh, in this industry. Um, what should the researchers do? Researchers also have, have powers. Um, we, we don't have a lot of money, but we have power. Um, and one of the power is to bring transparency and the science to this field. And we can open source our solution. We can do measurement in a very neutral and objective way, like we, what, we, what we did on um, payment card industry uh, data security standards, which um, we were invited to, to give talks at the Federal Trade Commission um, and share our findings. And, and it was quite impactful. People start to notice, you know, oh, there's the enforcement. There's really a huge gap between the specification you know, what you want to achieve and what the actually can be achieved in this way. This is a specification, what you hope to achieve and the way you, what you can, what you actually achieve, right? So, so re researchers, um, um, yeah, I think really has this in, in this very unique position because we are, you know, a sort of neutral party. You know, we have a lot of, uh, um, um, in a vast space for us to operate. Um, and so, you know, we do have to identify the, the right program, the right problem to work on. And I think, you know, in this space, there are so many problems to work, to work on and in terms of find a better scanner, produce better scanners. And the research community should also embrace those kind of solutions. Um, we are lucky that our um, payment card industry paper got uh, accepted in the first try, um, but my my other um, paper sometimes we try to bring bring open source solutions and with a better accuracy um, and more deployable and 
get dinged all the time. People are like, say, oh, I, I've seen something like this it's like five years ago. We, we, we don't want to see this anymore. Even though you tell them, you know, the, the industry, the, the practice, practitioners, they really are struggling. They are struggling with false positives. You know, you really need to have a, a better ways and more innovative ways of scanning softwares for vulnerabilities. Um, so our research community really should should rethink um, some 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 um, uh, of our work um, be able to cover uh, deployment, um, you know, just to diversify our contributions. Um, another direction that I've been consistently um, doing is also to democratize uh, data breach prevention knowledge. And like, like this talk that we've done, we also put together uh, short videos uh, and on YouTube. So some of them are very popular. And in two, uh, three of the students, uh, two of them are undergraduates and one, one um, is a high school student. Um, and so, so I think a lot of people don't understand that you see data breach, people immediately get scared. They're like, oh, oh my goodness, um, this is happening again. What should I do? Um, and so you just have to face your fear. And we have, um, we're in a very unique position, we as a researchers, and we have the ability to tell people in plain words, you know, what's happening. Um, and so that they, they understand, you know, we really need to have a lot of awareness so that you can, um, you know, find the government officials who also un understand the situation, who, are, who would stand behind the consumers um, and will lend their voice to uh, uh, privacy and data protections uh, of consumers. Um, and so um, let me just think. Um, all right. So um, so that's that's pretty much what I want to say. Um, in um, acting back what I said earlier, computing is really something. Um, you know, as you can see, it's much more beyond the coding. You know, we 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 do a little bit of the investigation. Um, we set up uh, perimeters. So we um, talk with people, talk with different stakeholders, um, and and we analyze. You know, just a bigger social economic. Um, System that in, that cybersecurity is um, uh, involved in, so it's no, it's not just a technical aspect. As a matter of fact, if you only focus on the special technical aspect, uh, a lot of time that um, it's not complete um, because in, 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 at certain level, some solutions will be used by person, um, used by security analysts, uh, used by users, and so so there's uh, uh, many different factors you do have to consider. Um, and I just I find it a very fascinating. Um, in um, it, it just help help me personally, and also help, you know just to enable me to help more people. Um, and so so like Ashoka mentioned that I do hope that uh, um, some of the young students would seriously consider cybersecurity, and especially I see a lot of opportunities that would um, help practitioners to better do their job. Um, uh, every day. Um, and so you have beautiful theories and, and beautiful solutions that work beautifully on paper, but, but, then, but then you do have to make them usable in practice. Um, and, and the usability creates a lot of issues. Um, um, sometimes, you know, some of my machine learning solutions, I, I look at it, you know, a, a few years later, I was like, no one will be able to use this because two PhDs, it requires two PhD students to fine tune the system, to fine tune the model, to get it to work. Um, how, how can this be deployable? If I make, if I open a company, I won't be able to make money because you know whenever I sell a model, I have to send the two PhD students <laughs> to my clients to help them fine tune their their model. Is just uh, um, uh, not usable. And so, so when you think about when you start to think about deployment. Um, do you see a lot of uh, research opportunities? Um, so, so that's that's it. Um, that's it for today. Um, and I, um, I, we have a lot of time for discussion and questions. Thank you, Daphne. Um, so it, it sounds like not having a usable system is like a consulting opportunity for students to make their consulting startups and make a lot of money by by uh, supporting these uh, not so useful solutions. Uh, so thank you very much.
uh, uh, we have some questions already in the Q and A. And for those of uh, the rest of the audience, if you have questions, you can uh, put that into the Q and A box that you see at the bottom of your screen, and uh, and and we can ask uh, Daphne to answer these questions. Uh, so let me start with the uh, first question that we have here. Uh, so Dave asks, uh, you talk about segmenting the internal network. Uh, what, what about more innovative uh, security thinking like uh, Google's uh, zero trust networking initiative that uh, they have been advocating? Yeah. I, I'm not uh, particularly familiar with this zero trust uh, networking initiative. I did, uh, I think I saw, I saw it somewhere. Um, and so, but, 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 but this is a great question, Dave. Um, one of the, um, uh, one of the um, uh, sort of um, innovative, sort of, sort of more proactive type of solution um, uh, approach, there, there, there are a few. One of them is um, uh, moving target defense. Uh, this is where you don't have a stat static IP address. Your IP address keep changing, and your other information could also be keep changing. Your, your host name could keep changing. And one of the the difficulty is that uh, you, if um, you, your name keeps changing, how can your associates in the the you know, your clients find you? And so there are ways to to resolve this. Um, and uh, I personally, I have done uh, some work from a numerical aspect, uh, you know, anomaly detection, where you detect um, um, uh, outliers. In, instead of saying, you know, a particular rules um, uh, string, um, you know, if you think of an intrusion detection system, um, you don't detect, you don't, you don't just detect the existing. Um, vulnerable patterns. You also detect new patterns that deviates from previous uh, behaviors. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, I, I think I think absolutely. I think those kind of a new initiative gonna, uh, will be very important in the, in on top of um, basics, you know, like patching and, and network segmentation. Um, absolutely like uh, moving away from this old fashioned thinking of sort of uh, having a, a firewall and everything inside the firewall is secure and everything outside is untrustworthy and so on. Yeah, yeah. and I, I should also say that Ashokan has done a lot of work on hardware uh, solutions where um, you know, there's um, hardware enabled isolation in computation that protects privacy information. Those are also very um, advanced technologies. Um, on top of those the more conventional solutions. Um, thank you. So we have another question here. Um, uh, the question asks uh, about the fuzzy fingerprint detection that you mentioned as part of your work. Uh, does fuzzy fingerprint detection at network boundaries require essentially like a man in the middle setup inside corporate systems so that employees accessing uh, TLS secured websites would have their website private data accessible by these by fuzzy fingerprint scanners? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a great question. Yes, indeed. Uh, correct. And and so uh, in order to do this kind of network monitoring, you, you do have to have this type of setup. And as a matter of fact, very interestingly, um, you'll be surprised how many men in the middle set up are available um, on uh, government employees' machines. Um, and so sometimes uh, at Virginia Tech, we have a lot of students whose parents work for the government or government contractors. And, and so, um, and, and sometimes I have, uh, especially when I talk about TLS and certificates, I'll have them, you know, look at the, the certificates and, and so on. And, and just lots of time that they, they have, they have men in the middle installed because it's, you know, their parents' company organizations that require them to install this um, and so 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 for for this may or may not be feasible um, um, in uh, although in particular for for our case uh, this reminds me that we are looking to detect the exposed data so um, so we don't uh, we don't we don't need to look at uh, encrypted we don't need to look at encrypted traffic if it's encrypted then we just let it go we don't only look at exposed data that is not encrypted um, uh, in cloud situation uh, if you're a cloud portal um, if you're a cloud portal, you, you, you don't have to set up a, a man in the middle. Um, 
in, uh, so I apologize that I confused with my other work that did require my in the middle. Uh, but, but for this uh, fuzzy fingerprint, we don't. Uh, the cloud will just uh, you know, sit and, and look at the unencrypted traffic if there's any. If it's encrypted, the cloud will let it go. Could still be malicious data leak, but then uh, it's out of the scope. Um, and we are considering adver um, advertent data leak where people are innocent and they just forgot, forgot to encrypt. Do you, so, so following up on that, do you have any thoughts on sort of uh, several recent works that look at uh, encrypted channels and then try to detect, uh, um, you know, make some inferences about the data that goes via encrypted channels by doing uh, you know, some kind of statistical analysis? Um, oh, oh, yes, I'm, I'm looking at the, the, the next question. Okay, the, uh, the top one. Um, yeah, the top one is what you answered. So I, before I come to the next one, I wanted to ask this. Uh, this oh, okay. You mean, like uh, you mentioned that you only target uh, uh, inadvertent data breaches. So you, you sort of uh, leave uh, uh, data breaches that happen via encrypted tunnels as out of scope. So right. I was asking for uh, your thoughts on um, these approaches that actually try to look at encrypted channels to try to infer information about what goes on. And would that be a, a way for you to yeah 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 that that we we did consider um we did consider i've, I've done some earlier work that uh, um look at uh protocol re, um uh, reverse engineering protocol um that that look at the encrypted traffic um but if it's just you know i i think sometimes see if the encryption is weak then certainly um you, you might be able to um figure something out, but, but then, you know, you could also look at the volume of the encryption that if it, it goes uh, too much and so on, uh, that, that you trigger an alert. Um, in, in, I, I would say in general, if we reverse engineering encryption, that, that may not be very feasible in, in my mind in terms of, you know, uh, being a deployable solution. Um, it is just for the, for the sheer volume of encrypted traffic, it's, it's gonna be, um, um, difficult to reverse engineer, um, and uh, for and for for some in and, and also for government agents for for like for some government agents for some for some organizations this may be allowed. Some some um, companies may, may not allow this. Um, uh, for for I, based on my experiences, the government agencies and they're like you know they can do you can do anything uh, on their computers uh, as long as you justify it's uh, for security and then so the and the government employees are more sort of used to this kind of monitoring and so on but but for private sectors and, and sometimes it's, it's difficult but um for, for therefore the for the um for detecting detecting uh malicious data leak um i would say at the network uh border you know, the volume, the volume pattern, um, the day of the uh, time of the day would be more usable attributes uh, in turn, in, to, to, to monitor as, as opposed to like deep packet inspection, that, that would be difficult. Um, so, so the question I had a follow up, I think you, you answered this by saying that in that particular case, you, you were not concerned with uh, um, encrypted traffic. But perhaps you can still comment on it in general, where where there are solutions that require a man in the middle setup. Uh, would the machines having this man in the middle setup not themselves be a vulnerable point in the internal infrastructure? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a great question, um, and it, it it really depends. It's hard to say. I mean, uh, before before I, I would say before I uh, you know I would say hard to know, <laughs> and so um, but but. Um, but in some scenarios that, you know, if you say insider threat detection, uh, if, if you do, if, 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 if the organization um, allow this in the middle setup, um, and then you do perceive insider threats as uh, one of the, um, in your threat model, then, you know, you could justify this as um, somewhat um, doable. Um, and and, cert and 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 certainly, you know, you ha you do have to consider, you know, how much privacy does this impact uh, your employees? And the last time that if the employees, uh, if, if employee don't know, 
and then later on discover that you've been monitoring all their traffic all the time, then it will, it will definitely damage morale. And then if you tell them we're monitoring our traffic, that may also damage their morale. And, and so I, I think, you know, I, I think it's really depends. It's, it's really depends. And then I, and I've been, you know, Virginia Tech is located in Blacksburg and we are like, we, we, I keep saying a short drive um, to DC, but it's like four and a half hours to DC. But but there's a lot of government interactions, and, and so so I know I know in the U.S. government a lot of the the employees and they are very okay with this. But but I understand that that's not not an all organizations can do something like this. Um, and and certainly if it's this uh, being being hijacked, then that's going to be a, a huge problem. Um, so so I I, I think it's um, you know I I think it's really you know, you, you do you do have to be careful. And the the way that our solutions operate is is that if you encrypt, it, then we we just we let you go. If you don't encrypt, it, this is where we detect. And so therefore, we do uh, we we don't need to have uh, to set up this in the middle. And similarly, you can also detect uh, exposed data stored on file systems. If the file system is encrypted, then um, the scanning will will turn up turn up uh, nothing. Um, if you have sensitive files unencrypted uh, on the uh, file system, then the scanning will um, uh, will expose them, or will identify them. And, and so you, you'll be uh, able to say, oh, I, I really have to um, encrypt this. Thank you. So we are coming up to the end of the hour, but I wanted to ask sort of one final, final question. Uh, so the story that you sort of told about this PCI scanner was, was really depressing. Uh, that all the scanners, commercial scanners out there were, were subpar and they were still certified because uh, they were all bad. Uh, but, but you were able to show that there is a possibility to build a better scanner. So how did the story end? I mean, do they have better scanners now? Are they using your scanner or are there other, uh, are there better scanners that have come in? Has the certification process improved uh, for scanners? Yeah, this is a great question. Uh, we haven't we haven't really experimentally um, tested again. Uh, part of the reason is the PhD student left, and this is always an issue in academic setting. Um, I no, I we send them our scanner. I suspect that they um, they they did they, the, 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 we send the PCI Security Council our our scanner. Um, but then, and we also made that our scanner uh, available. It, it could be incorporated, uh, but we only um, scan uh, a partial um, uh, uh, properties, and so it's not a full fledged scanners. Um, and the 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 security console they maintain two test beds. Uh, we also gave them our test beds um, in. And so they, they delegate, I think the security council delegated the, the test bed development to some other companies. Um, so it, it is unclear, um, it, unclear what, what, you know, the follow up, but they seem to, you know, really, you know, uh, all the, the individuals involved they really uh, read our article. Um, and I'm very glad that they didn't, um, they, they were very, I, I, don't, I don't know, I, I feel like, um, they were um, they, they wasn't uh, as as uh, as an wasn't as sort of a house hostile uh, towards us <laughs> as I was expecting, and then pr probably they they just want to make us happy, and then so that we will go away, um, and that that's really what we did because you know they made you know my impression was that they are gonna do. Do good work, um, but but then they did point out that the test bed is is very difficult to, to set up in a way that it's keep evolving. It and they they're the biggest task that, that they face is that they um, they don't want people the scanner uh, vendors to. Um, to just guess the, the the vulnerable page. After you you do this test again and again, you kind of know which page is vulnerable, and so they have to keep evolving in different ways, and and that is really it's very time consuming. Um, and 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 the, the the next thing is also um, as I said that not. I, I vaguely remember like 60% some sort of, you know, scoring, like this is a top, like the best scanner they tested would only be able to detect uh, um, you know, a pretty 
small portion of the vulnerabilities that they tested and and and, and they really um and in the meantime that they have to help them they help they need to help the scanners pass and if you think of the the economic aspect of this the whole thing if i if i'm in the scanner business i would certainly not be the toughest scanner because that in that case you know people will likely say hey don't go to Daphne's okay her her, her scanner will will fail you um in and so so a lot of time that this this goes back to the the old you know um um the the disalignment of um uh, these these incentives of, of economics of uh, cyber security um so it's clearly an uh, uh, opening for better scanner certification platforms and uh, test bits and so on. Um, yeah. So so maybe there is an opportunity for for a company to address this need. Uh, thank you very much again uh, for taking time uh, this evening to to uh, give this talk. Um, oh, thank uh, you. And great discussions. Thank you. Uh, the next CPI talk will be at the end of uh, February. Uh, two of our um, CPI specialists on uh, quantum safe computing will talk about uh, their work and then quantum safe computing. Um, so I invite you to um, go to our webpage, cpi.uwatler.ca, and, uh, and the more details will be announced uh, on our CPI talk pages uh, around the beginning of next year. Thank you very much and uh, have a good evening. All right, bye.